presence this evening. We stand here in your house by faith. True Lord, your word says, to whom much is given, much is required. O oh, Father, help us always, always, only to lean on to you, O oh God. Let each one of us decrease and surrender completely into thy hands. Because as these things happen, like it has never, never happened in 2000 years of church history, you are also telling us the end is near. And telling us, be prepared, be ready. The day and the hour no man knows. Oh Father, touch our ears that we may hear when the trumpet is blown. And we may be among those who are caught up in the air to meet you, Lord. Every time we are in your presence, open our hearts, O oh God, that we may receive your word and allow your word to work in us as this word goes out tonight here and then through the world. O oh Father, prepare your servants, prepare your children. We pray for those who are still in their sickbed, a little John, Aunt Maria, all the others, raise them up from their sickbed, O oh Lord, that they may continue to serve you at your table. Thank you, Father. Speak to us tonight. For in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. We continue with our study of Gideon. I don't know why, but the Lord says it's still not time to move from Gideon. We've been looking at how so easy it is to compromise. How even the mighty men of God can begin and walk in faith and then just fade away in God's history. And we saw how we also can eat into the Canaanite culture. And before we know, there's no difference between us and them. Yet we are called to be different. So I wanted to look at a couple of verses quickly. Judges 6 and verse 11. 6 verse 11. And we find Gideon. Now we find Gideon, says the angel of the Lord came. And where is he? Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. When we find him, we see him in an exceedingly humble position. He's hiding in an empty wine press. That's where he is, threshing wheat in a very humble position. When his story ends, we read that in chapter 8, verse 27 and 33, we will see the end of Gideon. And Gideon made that gold he took from the people, which was plundered from the Midianites, into an effort, set it up in his city, Ophrah, and all Israel played the harlot with it there. And it became a snare to Gideon and to his house. When you come to verse 33, it says, So it was, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal Berit their God. This is how it ends. That's how it ends. And this is not the way it should end. Have we asked ourselves, why did this happen? Where did the shift take place? Where did the shift take place? Where did the shift take place for Gideon to start? Like, like remember all of our illustrations over the past years, when we program a, 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 a aircraft for its flight, you only have to go a tiny degree of tangent. Where the flight leaches, reaches in its final destination will be somewhere else. But while you are moving, you will never know it. Because it's only by a few degrees or maybe a degree or a fraction of a degree. The walk with God is a straight line. Somewhere along the way, Gideon shifted a little. What caused him to shift? It's important. God was showing me something else. What caused him to shift? See, God will also allow certain things to show things in us. When Gideon was still fearful, in spite of whatever God did, he told him, do one thing, go to the enemy's camp. Listen to what the enemy talks about you. Go into the world and listen to what the world talks about you, Vijay, or Reni, or Yash, or Andrew, anybody. Go to the world and listen to what they talk about you. So in Judges 7, if I'm right, in verse 14, he goes into the world. 
into the enemy's camp and he hears what the enemy talks about Gideon. So they are talking, two enemies, soldiers are talking about a dream. And then his companion answered, this is a Midianite, answered and said, this is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hand God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. What did the enemy say? The enemy doesn't know Israel's God. The enemy only sees Gideon. And what does it say? It says, this is the sword of Gideon. Now you look into verses 16 to 18. When the, just before the final bat battle. So it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he worshipped. That's it's good. He went back. Verse 16, he divided the 300 men into three companies and they put a trumpet into every man's hand with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. And he said to them, look at me, do likewise, watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then you shall also blow the trumpet on every side of the whole camp and say, and say, the sword of the, should have stopped there. Stop the sword of the Lord. See, the spiritual enemy already knows he's defeated. When God moves on to your side, he already knows he's defeated. Though your physical enemies may not know it, they may continue fighting. Satan knows he's defeated. So even in his defeat, he's plotting how to set you up in your victory. He's not going to let you enjoy that victory. So he says, you know what? Gideon, just say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. The sword of Gideon cannot bring any victory. Only the sword of the Lord can. That's where the shift occurs. And you know how it goes and goes and goes. And after a point, it's no longer the sword of the God. Even after the sword of the Lord is back in his sheath, the sword of Gideon is killing his own people now. And taking revenge for the killing of his brothers. And it finally ends up with the golden effort replacing or in competition with God's effort at Shiloh. It's a simple effort. The effort at Shiloh, if it is the effort built, made according to the directions, instructions given by God to Moses, then it is made of linen, of strings, I mean of, of threads of scarlet and purple four different colors, it is woven together. It's a linen effort. But what does Gideon make? He makes a golden effort. This golden effort is in competition with the linen effort. One is in Shiloh, the other is in his hometown. First, he put his sword along with the, the sword of the Lord. Now he has put his effort in competition with God's effort. I you seeing how it, how it shifts and how we need to be so, so, so careful because this subtle temptation is always there. It's always there. You know, it's what? It's God and Grace Tabernacle. It is God and Grace Tabernacle. It's not God and Grace Tabernacle. It is God. See, the power was of God. The wisdom, the directions was of God. The victory was of God. Therefore, the glory also should have been only of God. And this is something which we find so difficult to accept, especially if you are working anywhere, whether you are in the ministry or secular field, to accept the fact all this is of God. Very, very difficult to accept. So, Gideon shifted a little glory to himself. And by the time... It ended, the whole nation went spiraling down. No longer Gideon is dead, Gideon is dead. Now, even the golden effort doesn't hold their attention anymore. What does it say in verse 33? Chapter 8 and verse 33. Even the golden effort cannot hold them. It says, So it was, as soon as Gideon was dead, the children of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals. A golden effort can never hold your attention for too long. It will hold your attention only as long as Gideon is there. Once Gideon is gone, Gideon is gone, what happens? They go back to the Baals. What did God tell? 
What is that God told Gideon? Gideon, you see, I'm going to bring out my victory. I'm going to work this victory. And for this victory, I need only 300 people. 300 separated people. And they're going to use only three things. An empty pitcher, a torch, and a trumpet. That's all I need. That's all I need. There's something interesting about the empty pitcher and the trumpet. Both have to be empty. You cannot have a stuffed trumpet. If the trumpet is stuffed, if you try to blow, nothing will come. You cannot have a full pitcher. God said very clearly, empty pitcher. It has to be an empty pitcher. And also it has to be an empty earthen pitcher. One, it has to be empty because I'm going to tell you what to put into that picture. Second, it should be broken. It should be breakable. Last, this, did we, do we ask this question? What made that picture valuable to God or useful to God? It was not its use. It was not a shape or design. Not even what it contained once upon a time. Not from which house it came. The only thing that made that picture useful to God was one, it was empty, two, it was earthen. Nothing else mattered. But that two conditions had to be met. One, it had to be empty. Two, it had to be earthen. A golden picture wouldn't have done the work. A silver picture won't do the work. A brass pitcher won't do the work. A steel aluminium pitcher won't do the work because it will only be a stumbling block to God's work. It had to be an earthen pitcher. And if it was an earthen pitcher, its background didn't matter. It didn't matter where it came from. From a rich house or the beggar's house, it made no difference. If you are an earthen pitcher, it doesn't make any difference what your background is to God. Whether you are a pauper, or a prostitute, or a prince, or a princess, it makes no difference to God. God has used all kinds of people, but they have used them when they were empty pitchers. The minute they changed the nature of the vessel and became brass and silver and gold, they also stopped being useful in God's kingdom. But also was empty, otherwise it won't sound. Into the empty picture, something had to be introduced. That was the fire of God. An empty picture in itself is worth nothing. Something has to be put into that. Paul calls it in the book of Corinthians as treasure in earthen vessels. The fire of God. A trumpet in itself. It's only a decorative piece, you can keep it. But for it to be useful in the kingdom, the breath of God has to come into it. You have to blow into it. Then it sounds the alarm. Then the victory comes. But where was the snare? The snare was this. Also say, the sword of Gideon. Are you getting it? The snare always. Whenever something good happens to us, big happens to us, victory happens to us, we want to give glory to God because we are believers and we have heard the word so much. But at the end of it, we want to put our name also. God gave me this victory. God gave me this promotion. God gave me this thing and I prayed so much. <laughs> this will make it much more holy and change this thing. And says, I was fasting for seven days and on the eighth day I got the answer. God says it, it is fine. On the 21st day, I send the answer to Daniel, that is fine. Daniel didn't say it. So the question God is asking us is, what are we full of today? We have come into God's house. We have come into God's house. What are we full of today? When Gideon began and Gideon's victory came, it was because the pitcher was empty. When God found Gideon, Gideon was empty because he was sitting inside an empty wine press. There was nothing he could boast of. It was a weakling. And then God said, now I will make you into a mighty man of God. 
Are we full of the wisdom of the world, the ways of the world? Think, even when we are listening to the word, how are we reading the word? You kids from Seafell will know how we use theory to interpret. Are you using theory to interpret God's word? Or just allowing God to speak the word to interpret the word? Are you wise in the ways of the world? Or are we full of wealth? The gold and the silver? Or the desire for wealth? Either real wealth which we have or desire for wealth? Are we full of it? Or are we full of our own strength, our own resources? We know I can do it. Whatever situation, I will make a way for myself through it. In that case, we are in trouble. What are we full of? Are we full of appreciation? We want appreciation from the children of this world. Our hearts are always desiring. Ask a question. Otherwise, why did Gideon build a golden effort and put it there? What was the reason? Then, our land, our life becomes full of idols. And we start worshipping the work of our hands. It may not be a molten statue, but it's also the work of our hands. Now God has something to say about it, how we come to him. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 5 onwards. Oh Jacob, come to me, he says. 5 to 11. The house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. For you have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with what? Eastern. Now we are filled with not only Eastern, Eastern and Western ways. The only thing we are empty of is the Christian way. We look at Western and we think it is Christian. It is not Christian. The much of the culture we used to is pagan, Roman and Greek that is happening over there. It's got nothing to do with Christianity. God says, Israel, you know what? I picked you up and put you up there so that you would model to the world what I am. Instead, you are full of Eastern ways. And they are soothsayers like the Philistines. And you are pleased with the children of? Ah, you are very comfortable with the children of this world. Who are your best friends? All from the world. Whom are you texting and talking all the time? All the children of this world. You are so comfortable, right Israel? And then, verse 7. The land is also full of silver and gold and there is no end to their treasures. Now you've got so much money. You're full of wealth. So much money. Paycheck to paycheck. Promotion to promotion. Bonus to bonus. Investment here, investment there. You've got a lot of money. And there is no end to their chariots. Many, you've got a lot of strength. But you also, you know what? Because of all this, your land is also full of idols. And they worship the work of their own hands. The full. And God is asking us, has this become an end? All these things become an end in itself? What are our ways? Where have we picked our ways from? Is it eastern, western, northeastern, southeastern? Which is, what's our ways? Like I keep telling, our citizenship is of heaven. We know only one way. And we are always trying to align our lives to that way. What are our ways? Israel has picked up a lot of eastern ways. Our churches have picked up a lot of ways from the world. It's not from the world. Most churches, honestly, if you go check it out, most churches, it's not from the world anymore. It is from the world. They have picked up the ways of the east and the west and the north and the south. They picked it. And which ways have we picked up? What are the ways we have picked up? What are the arguments we make to walk in those ways? We keep on arguing, it is okay, it is okay. I need to be cool. I need to be cool. Nobody, like I said, nobody wants to be a fool. Except Paul in the Bible. If you're running actually after wealth, even if you not have much, is that a desire of your heart? I find my security in my job, my wealth. Richest king in Israel's history actually was not Solomon. He was rich because his father stored up a lot of money, a lot of gold, 
lot of treasures for him. But do you know why David stored it all up? To build God's house. Wealth for David was not an end in itself. For him it was to build God's house. For Solomon, wealth became an end in itself. He used wealth for pleasure. He used wealth for everything of the carnal mind. Not David. David stored up the wealth, invested the wealth to build up God's kingdom, his house. And God is asking us, if we are full of wealth, what are we using it for? Do you know that it is mine? If you are full of wisdom which I have given you, what have you used this wisdom for? If you are full of skills which God has given you, talents which God has given you, what are you using it for? The owner of the vineyard is going to come one day and ask each one of us. Everybody was given something and whatever you are given with, you are given to the filling, full. What did you use it for? Joseph and Daniel in their times were the wisest in their generation. Agreed? They used, both of them used their wisdom to glorify God. But the wisest man mentioned in the Bible was Solomon. What did he use his wisdom for? Debauchery. How does he end? As an empty man. Empty. Empty. Miserable. Wreck he ended. He began full, ended empty. Understand this. God always comes and meets a man, a woman or a child in their emptiness. He never fills full vessels. He never fills full vessels. That's why he comes and meets Gideon, when he's absolutely empty and says, mighty man of God, I can make you into a mighty man of God. There must have been great warriors, many around in that country, but he couldn't make any one of them into a mighty man, because they were full of themselves. And God is asking us, even as we are today here in God's house, are we full or are we empty? If you are empty, God says, I can fill you. But then you should know that it's I who fill you. It's not your strength, it's not your power, it's not your wisdom. Please remember, he never fills full vessels. Understand this one principle, emptiness is a choice. It's a choice. Emptiness is a choice. This can be full or empty, there is a choice involved. If I turn it around, it will be empty. If I keep it like this, it will be Full emptiness is a choice you and I make, make to empty. And if we are empty, please be sure we will be filled one way or other. There is nobody here who is empty. Everybody is full. It's one thing or the other. Even through these three days, you have filled yourself with something or the other. But there are no empty. Dead people are empty. Third thing, what we are filled with is also a choice. That's also a choice. To be empty is a choice. To be, you will be filled one way or other. And what you want to be filled with is also a choice. And every one of them, us will have to make that choice. You please remember this, we remember this, when Gideon at the end of the story is so full of himself, Israel becomes empty of the presence of God. And when Gideon dies, even that symbol of the religion, the golden effort, people leave that and go after Baals. God is asking, are we filled with the influences from the East and the West? Because the West today is as pagan as the East. We clap, one version will say, we clap hands to the children of foreigners. Wherever they are found celebrating stuff according to their ways, we are right there with them and celebrating. Found in all their occasions, all their celebrations, all their 
activities, we are right there with them. And we don't feel even the need, we need to be separated. And God says, who are your friends? Remember what God speaks through the book of Ezekiel about Sodom and Gomorrah? This was the sin of your sister Sodom. What was it? Fullness of bread. Fullness of wealth. Manifestation was homosexuality. Reason? Fullness. When you are full, don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to do because you know what? It's me, a class 7 or class 6 struggling 17, 18, 19 year old young man or a woman who has failed many times, doesn't have much money in the house, parents are poor and tell them this is what the Lord said. They will say, yes pastor, I listen. I will listen. Get me somebody with an MPhil or a PhD full of them and says, this is what the Lord says. Don't tell me what to do. Tell me. Unless they have emptied themselves. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. Because we are full. When we are filled with fullness which the world offers, please know this, we become empty towards God. God, God cannot use us. God is asking us, why do we always run after a paycheck, a better job, more raise? What is the, the intent behind it? God always looks at it. In itself, to look for a better job with a better salary, there is nothing wrong in it. But God doesn't look at the surface, He looks at the intent. What is the intent behind it? Do we find glory in the treasures of this world? Please remember, behind the treasures of this world is also comes the gods of this world. Verse 8, that's from Isaiah chapter 2. Land is also full of idols. Worship the work of their hands, that which their own fingers have made. When Gideon was empty in the wine press, he was found by God. When he was found full, he was left by God. Now, in Isaiah chapter 2, Israel is full but empty. Empty trumpets will sound his alarm. Stuffed trumpets will sound their own voices. If you are full of bitterness, envy, anger, lust, pride, self, please understand this. Doesn't matter how much you pray, God cannot fill you because you are already full. No one fill me. God says empty. He's always looking for empty pictures to put his light in. He's always looking for empty trumpets to blow his breath in to, to, to warn the world. In the picture, you can't fill yourself with stuff and then come and say, God, fill me. God says, I don't. Empty. 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 I'm not a respect for persons. I'm not a respect for person. The king's son and the beggar's son, I will fill if they empty. Both has to empty. Both has to empty. If you fill and you're full of something, I cannot fill you. But if you choose in your privacy to cry out to me and empty yourself all of your resentment and your anger and your bitterness and your envy and your lust and all the stuff you have taken and empty it, I will fill you. But filling is secondary. Primary is empty. First thing I have to do is empty. God will do the filling. I can't go to God and say, Lord, fill me without emptying myself. He says, I will not. I cannot. In 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, one, yeah. there is a broken woman at the end of her rope. A certain woman of the wives of the son of the prophets cried out to Elisha saying, Your servant, my husband is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? She said, Your maid servant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors. Empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. 
Now, Jewish history says this woman is the wife of Obadiah, the one who had hidden the prophets during the reign of Ahaz. He's dead. And he is in debt because he used all his resources and borrowed from the creditors to feed God's prophets. And he was one among them. He was one among the 7,000 who hadn't bent their knees to Baal. And now she then often will wonder, why Lord is it happening? Didn't he serve you? Didn't he serve you? Remember Sunday's message, everything God allows is for a purpose, for, for his glory. See, at the end of the rope, God's answer to her through his servant is only one. Go get empty vessels. Go get empty vessels. Each home she went, she had to get empty vessels. If it were full, it had to be empty. And if anybody said, my vessel is full, I can't give it to you, you have to leave and go to another house. You can't say, my vessel is half full, please give it to me, that's okay. No, it has to be empty vessels. Can you think about the woman as a church? And her sons as going into bondage? Think about the woman as the church and her sons as going into bondage. And what is the answer? She's crying out to the Lord, Lord, my children are going into bondage. What is the answer? God says the answer is in empty vessels. The answer, church, is in empty vessels whom I will fill and your children will come out of bondage. Only empty vessels can be filled by me. Not half full, not three quarters full. It has to be empty. Only one condition. It has to be empty. And then, when you get those empty vessels and you come in, do one thing. Shut the door behind you. What happens next has got nothing to do with the rest of the world. It's got nothing to do with the people who gave you empty vessels without inquiring what is it for. It doesn't have to know it. The world doesn't have to see it. Something will happen in the secrecy of your house. Where only you and I will know what has happened there. In John chapter 15 and verse 5, God tells all of us. He says, I am the wine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Honestly. Honestly, 100%, how many of us can really say, without you I can do nothing? Tell him how you will know. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, God says, don't move, stay there. I want you to do nothing today. You will know. Lord, he says, I'm not coming with you. You said yesterday, right? You cannot do anything with me. So today I'm not coming with you. Let me see. And if you really believe, you will just stay there. Just stay, stay there. Why am I doing anything? Because God said, I cannot do anything. He's saying, much activity doesn't mean we are obedient. Much activity can be also a result of disobedience and rebellion. Jesus says, you cannot do anything without me. Because I am the wine, you are the branches. The branches do not have a life of its own. Take the branch of the wine, you are dead. Break the branch of the wine and leave it over there doesn't mean immediately it will turn brown and break and become dust. No, for a long time it will look green. But in the spiritual realm only we will see that. Many men and women who have been broken off still look green. But God knows they have been broken off. He says a season will come when it will dry up. Nothing will be left. Nothing will be left of their work because they are doing it on their own. You know, when Gideon started and he progressed and the victory all happened, it looked as if he was a green branch. And the golden effort also was put in. Now he's becoming king and priest and everything and going on. Everybody thought Gideon was green. But you know what happened? One day, they realized, history records, he wasn't green. He ended up as a dry branch. Great record of being Defeating the Midianites is recorded. At that point, he was a man of faith. 
He did not die a man of faith. He died a man of flesh, dead branch. On chapter 6 and verse 53, says, 53, 350. And Jesus said to them, most assuredly, look at how he says, I'm telling you 100%, most assuredly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. These are the teachings which they found it very difficult to take. He said, unless you have met me at the cross, you have no life. You have not met me at the cross where you have partaken of my sacrifice and my resurrection, you are dead. Doesn't matter what the world says. Doesn't matter how many eulogies the world writes, how many lines the newspapers and the magazines gave you, it makes no difference. You are dead. There's no life. There's no life. Isn't that what Saul told Samuel? Sorry, Samuel told Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 15, if I'm right, and verse 17. 17. Samuel said, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? Did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? You know when God made you head? It's when you were little. Now that you are big, he is taking the throne from you. Because he says in God's kingdom, only little people rule, big people don't rule. When you were empty, Saul, I made you the head. Now that you are full, I am taking you off. That's best with empty vessels, broken vessels, broken bread, broken and contrite hearts. That's what he does best, works best with. Please remember, many, many in the church while worldwide will never be used of God because they refuse to be emptied. And those who refuse to be emptied cannot be broken. Cannot be broken. If you are not emptied, you cannot be broken. So there is no point in breaking. Because if you are broken, it is terrible. Something else will show, not his light. Light in shine must shine. The enemy is scared only of that light and the sound of the trumpet. He's not scared of you or me. He's not scared of you or me. Can come with any number of degrees, any number of qualifications, any amount of wealth. He's least bothered. But if there is the light and his breath, he's scared. God says, shut the door. Shut the door. Remember Jairus' daughter was brought to life? Jesus got in and shut the door. Outside were the discoffers. When Dorcas was raised from the dead, Peter shut the door behind him. Miracles usually, real miracles usually take place behind closed doors, not on public podiums. So then, the glory belongs to God. And what did Jesus tell them? Don't tell anybody what happened to you. Let's not self tell you. Put it on posters around all the walls. Six miracles in our last meeting. Come, come, everyone, come. Jesus said, don't say. You look at how many people he healed and said, don't talk about this. Chapter 17 and verse 28. Remember. A branch doesn't have life on its own. At 17 verse 28. For in him we live and move and have, and have our being. So difficult to accept, right? In him we live and no pastor I came in my two wheeler. I did not move in him. But because his hand was there over your life, the two wheeler reached the church. Because you were in him, you reached here safely and have our being. There stood that woman with the door shut and all around, what do you see? Empty vessels. But it's been a very funny sight. An old woman 
her sons going into slavery, about to go into slavery, and God's solution, she's standing over there with a room full of empty vessels. You would prefer it. Easy thing is to go and tell a woman go to a neighbor and say, give me a little rice, give me a little haldi, give me a little masala, give me a little vegetable. And she said, go get all empty stuff from it. Empty containers. This plastic dabba will do? Yes, that is fine. I got only old wine skin bag, that will do. Anything empty. What do you have? What does she have? A little flask of oil, a little jar of oil. She has a little jar of oil. That's what God is asking each one of us. What is that you have? What is that you have? Lord, all I have, actually in this life I can acknowledge what I have, truly have, which belongs to me, is the little anointing you gave me. Everything else is transitory, it can go. The only thing that can, cannot go are the calling and the gifts. The calling and the gifts are irrevocable. All I have, O oh Lord, is a little anointing. He says, are you willing to pour this little anointing into these empty vessels? You willing to pour your little anointing into this empty vessel? But Lord, you look at me anointing. It's only this much. And look at the vessels. God says, it doesn't matter. This is not your doing, this is mine. Because the anointing is not yours, it is mine. There is no end in my anointing. But Lord, look, only this much. Look at the containers. God says, just pour. Filling is my job, just pour. But Lord, if I pour, what happens to my oil? What happens to my anointing? And these vessels are all somebody else's. No, Lord, I will do one thing. I'll pour my anointing over my son. At least it will remain in my house. This is my vessel. She must have also had a couple of vessels in her house, however poor. The poor. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Because our God is a God who loves pouring. Out his anointing into empty vessels. That's how Jesus life begins, ministry begins. He comes excitable day. It's a wedding. Jesus and his disciples also had been called to a wedding. And they came. And then suddenly whisper. Silence, confusion. What has happened? Wine has run out. It has run out. Mary tells the servants. Go to him. He is the only one who knows how to deal with emptiness. I can't do anything with wine is run out, the vessels are empty. What can I do? There's only one who can deal with emptiness. Go to him. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, You know what? There are six empty stone jars. How many? Six empty stone jars. Before that day happened, that empty stone jars were filled with water and they were used to wash hands, wash feet, wash faces. Maybe some child sneaked in and had a bath also. What was the testimony of those stone jars? Oh. Look at my hands. Are they clean? Yes, I washed it with that water. That water is really good. Look at my feet. Doesn't it look good? You know what? I used that water. But at the end of that day, it is not water. It is joy. Everybody is asking, where did that wine come from? Where did that wine come from? Are you sure? Can wine come from that? Can something that brings so much joy come from that? Old stone jar? God said, yes, it can. You know why? Because I filled it this time. It's I who did the work. And how did it happen? Because it was empty. There were many vessels in the house, but they were all full. There were only six empty ones. And they were just plain old stone jars. Are you getting the picture? 
It's interesting. Rather interesting if you went into that woman's house that day. I want to think it that way, relating it to our situation. So many different kinds of containers are sitting in that house. Most complex set of containers. What is this? Oh, I got it from that lady. The lady only had a garbage can. I said, that is okay. Give it. You see, emptied the garbage and gave it to me. Another has a rice cup, emptied the rice and gave it. Another had a wheat container, emptied and gave it. All kinds of containers. Only one thing was common about all of them. They were all empty. Garbage can, flower pot, old skin bag, white trash can, black trash can, brown trash can, as they call our people who have been anointed by God. You know what they call them? Ex con can, ex prostitute can, ex HIV can, the condemned trash cans. You know what God has done? He's filled them with his oil. See? They were found empty. All of them were found empty. There is one common denominator about all the people who hear testimony after testimony. They are all empty. They are all empty. Every one of them empty. All kinds of vessels are acceptable to our Lord as long as they are empty. Doesn't matter what your background is. Doesn't matter where you came from. Doesn't matter what your past is. The only question God asks is, have you emptied so that I can fill you? What was foolish about the five foolish virgins? What are they called? Foolish? What are they called? They called virgins. Now, what does that mean? They were not polluted by the world. But they were still foolish because when the knock came, they were empty. It is not that they were not separated from the Eastern and the Western ways. It is not they had idols and idolatry in their lives. The problem was when the knock came, they were empty. It is not enough to be separated from. It's even more important you are separated unto. You know why so many of you, honestly, so many of you are struggling, struggling because you are hearing the word and you are trying to separate from without actually separating unto. That's why you are struggling. You separate from and because you are not separating unto, you go back. Once you are separated unto, he fills you. Then there is no going back. Then the same testimony becomes our testimony too. Because it's the same God who will fill a trash can and the king's cup. He will, he will do it. He's not a respect of any person. But once it is done, all they will do, see is what was it filled with. Because he is the Lord of the vineyard. In Mark chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, the Lord of the vineyard is looking for fruit. Why do you have a vineyard? So that you can have fruit. And at vintage time, scripture says, at vintage time, he sent a servant to the wine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the wine dressers. What did they do? But they took him and beat him and sent him away. How did they send him? And the Holy Spirit is forever coming and says, some fruit, some fruit. The father is asking for some fruit. We beat him and sent him away empty handed. Some fruit, some fruit. No, some fruit. I need to go to the Father and show some fruit. He is the wine dresser. Some fruit. He says, back off. I don't want to hear anything. Don't tell me anything. I'm saved and that's enough. Don't tell me. You know what? That's what they did. And God says, at the end, what the wine dresser does? He says, your life is mine. Your health is mine. Your time is mine. Your wealth is mine. What are you doing with all of this? Where is the fruit? You see, there are only two kinds of trees found in the Bible. If you want to put it in broad categories, fruit trees and firewood trees. Matthew 3, 10. Matthew 3 and verse 10. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. 
Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. He says, if you do not function as a fruit tree, then the only place for you is to become Pharaoh. 21 and verse 19. verse 19. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said to it, Let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately the fig tree withered away. He says, I am not fooled by outward trappings of religiosity. When I come, I am looking for a real fruit. If I don't see it, let your life wither away. Remember, Naomi, we've been studying Ruth in Ruth chapter 1 and verse 21. Naomi's comment about her own life I went out full, and the Lord has brought me again home again. Who brought me out empty? But God's answer is through a Gentile woman who emptied herself. A gentile woman in her commitment is emptying herself completely. We've been studying quite a few Sundays about what Ruth says, Your God, my God, your people, my people. Right? Where you go, I go. Where you lost, what is she doing? Ruth is taking her entire history, her upbringing, her family, her own life and emptying herself. And he says, I know no one other than your God. And God used that woman to fill Naomi. In Ruth chapter 3 and verse 17, Boaz, the heavenly bridegroom, Jesus type, Boaz will say, and he, she said, This six ephahs of barley he gave me, for he said to me, Do not go empty to your mother in law. Who said this? Jesus or Boaz. A lot of people in the church saying that I went full, God made me empty. And God will find all those emptied ones and fill them and says, go to them and say, this is what my heavenly bridegroom said, I will not come to you empty handed. Take this miracle and go. Take this breakthrough and go. Take this deliverance and go. Go. Because God has sent me to fill you up. Because you are always complaining against God, right? I was full when I was in the world. Now that I have become a Christian, I have nothing. God says, take it. God is an interesting God. A very interesting God. Second Timothy, as we close, Second Timothy chapter 2, 20 to 21. Timothy 2. In a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay. Some for honor, some for Dishonor. Therefore, if anyone empties himself, I want to put the word instead of cleansing, I want to put it as empty. If anyone empties himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for the Lord. Use for what? For honor, sanctified, and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. And Ephesians 5.20 says, when you do this, no, no, not 5, 320, let's try 320, Ephesians 320, 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to that power that works, in us. He says, if you empty yours, so do you have any clue what God can do with the surrendered vessel? Have you any clue? Eyes have idea, ears have no idea where God can stretch the power with which He can fill you. But only empty vessels. The whole idea is, like I said, it's a choice. Emptiness is a choice. What we fill it with it is a choice. What we have filled with us is our choice. You're getting the picture? And if Matthew 12, 43 to 45 has a note of warning, if you don't fill an empty vessel with God, Matthew 12, verses 43 to 45. Matthew 12, 
When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it. He finds it. Okay. What you fill it with is your choice. Is it empty? Not only empty, swept and put it in. Oven, all the shelves, all the wardrobes, everything is empty. What does he do? He goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. <clears throat> you didn't fill your emptiness with God. We are empty to be filled with God. Please remember Sunday's message and put this together. Gideon was an empty vessel, ended up full of himself. The danger we are all caught in with success is that we can fill success with ourselves and not with God. A young man came to an old saint and said, How can I be filled with God? The old man said, Come with me. And took him to a river and said, Come along with me into the river. And he walked. The old man walked with him and walked with him. The water came up. The water came up. And the water came up. And water came up. Water came till the chin. Then he took the young man and put his head under the water. Last minute, he took it out. He said, why did you do this to me? He said, when your head was under water, what was the only thing you thought and longed for? He said, air. When you desire for God, that way he will fill you. He will fill you. That's what we sang. As the deer panted for the water, so my soul longs after you. Anything else? Anything else? Whatever else we do, if this is not there, it is not worthy of this God. This awesome God. It's not worthy of this God. Anything else you give or do, doesn't matter how much sacrifice is there and how much dedication is there, it's not worthy of this great and awesome God. And he says, I will fill you. Then he says, I will fill you. I will fill you. You read through the Gospels. You read through the life of Jesus. That's exactly what he's doing through his life. Father, you and you and I. Imagine to have that amount of anointing and power and not to move for 30 years into the public realm. To you, your will have I come. It's about you, O oh God. It's not about me. It's about you. Remember his, his prayer before Lazarus' grave? Read, read closely, line by line, you need to go. Father, I know you always hear me. It's no block. But I'm saying it loud. I'm putting it in our language. I'm saying it loudly so that they may hear. I don't even have to ask you. I know you will do it because I never ask you anything other than to glorify you. I don't have a life separate from you. My life is about you. But for their sake, I'm, I'm voicing it so that they will know. Think the picture. That's what God is asking us. Are we, are we, are we miserable? Are we confused after so many years of sitting under the word? Are we so confused? Are we so miserable? And we get upset when we hear these testimonies from around the world of people who started yesterday and day and day for yesterday have zoomed ahead with God. You know the simple thing? They all had to come to the end of their rope and be empty. Almost every one of them you have heard the names about them. Their only thing is this, Lord, we just want to glorify you and nothing else. Nothing at all. We are thinking about if you are young in your 17s, 20s, 30, 25, 26, 27, you are already starting. Will I get married? Will I get married? Will I get married? Will I find a boy? Will I find a girl? Will I get a job? Will I get a provision? What will I do? All we are still worrying about. I should I should know because I hear it. I hear about you from them both ways. All we are worrying about is this, like this, like, like that. Here is a set of people, many of them are immensely blessed by God. 
God saying we lay it at the foot of the cross. All we want to do is live for you. And if God sends them that way, are we amazed? Are we amazed? But I still anyone here, anyone here, anyone, anyone here. Before that, we need to say, Lord, it's about you. I messed up. Big time, I messed up. They all messed up. Every one of them messed up. But from there, they stood up and said, Lord, I realized I got messed up because it was about me and not about you. Now that I have come to this point in my life, I want it to be everything about you and nothing about me. And God says, you shall be my vessels. Now I pour my anointing through you into the lives of others. When he says not to excite us, it is to move us even more forward towards the God. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I need you more. I also need you. Whatever my purpose is may not be similar as that, but I want to be filled with you. I want to be filled with you. I want you. I want to breathe. It's not enough that we sing, you are the air that I breathe. God says, if I am the air that you breathe, when you breathe out, why does it stink? The air that breathe, you breathe. And when you exhale, it should be my name, my glory, my honor, my life. It all should be all about me. Not, I am not the air that you are breathing. You are breathing something else. Why do you struggle with this? Why do you struggle with this? It's not so complicated. It's so simple. So simple. Tell you, empty your heart and fill with the obedience and say, Lord, teach me. Your eyes are open. It's as simple as that. As simple as that. Empty yourself. Lord, let me look. What I can get out of this? No. I empty my heart. Sit before you in obedience. Fill me, Lord, with your truth. So that I can glorify you. Says, it's done. It's a done deal. It's as simple as that. It's a done deal. But if it's a litany of complaints, a litany of getting big in this world, it's, it's going to be like Steve Jobs' Stanford speech. Everybody's talking about that. Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs, Steve. Apple, iPad, iPhone. I, 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 it's all I. And what was his symbol? His symbol was the apple bitten with a rainbow over it. Remember apple's first symbol? Did you ever think about it? What was apple's first symbol? The fruit that man ate to fall over it. He put a rainbow saying there's nothing wrong with that. Knowledge of evil, of good and evil. There's nothing wrong with that. What is the current symbol? A polished silver apple bitten off from the end. Isn't he our icon? Everybody is eyes sad. You need to read that man's life. And you will realize, hey, there's something funny about this man. Something very, very funny about this man. Very funny about him. I'm not talking about him. I'm talking about what is available in the public realm about this man. We get carried away by all this thing. We want to read, our children to read Steve Jobs, Stanford University speech. We read it. It is a secular mantra. It's got nothing about the living God. It's a false hope. And they are putting it across as the man who embodied the American dream. No, the American dream was something else. Where a man could come escaping persecution of religion from the shores of Europe, come to a land where you would be free to worship God. That was the American dream. That was the American dream with which the Pilgrim Fathers came. That was the American dream. Not to go rich in this world and make your own gospel. The American dream was give us a land of God where we can freely worship you. That was the American dream. We have changed the American dream. And we have all eaten into it. That's the Western ways I'm talking about. Eastern ways and the Western ways. And we have all eaten into it. We think this is the gospel. God says that's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. When your life ends, you may not even be known. You may be even considered the biggest failure of your generation, like Moses was. And he died. He was a failure. 
He didn't take anybody in. He himself died. Just before his experiment was successful, he died. When Paul died, he was abandoned by everybody. But God's history talks about them differently after their death. Not when they were living. Not when they were living. Not when they were living. Joseph died at the peak of his glory. So when Israel left Egypt, even his bones were carried off and brought and buried in the grave of his fathers. Does anybody know where Moses is buried? Nobody knows. That's how he died. Was he faithful? Was he filled? Yes, he was. Was Paul filled? Yes, he was. So don't, don't think the end is written during our lifetime. It may not be even. If you're thinking about before I die, I will have glory and I will be recognized even in the church. Please don't think it may not even happen. It may not even happen. The world will recognize me. If not, at least the church will recognize me. It may not even happen. There's one who said, I will recognize you. The day will come. And the whole universe will know. That's the hope of glory. That's the hope we have. That's the only hope we have. It's not good to be recognized now. It can be quite dangerous. It can be quite dangerous. Like Gideon was recognized during his time. Moses had everybody after him all the time. Oh, recognized. From the time he went into Egypt till the time he did, they were always angry with him. Gideon became a big man in his time. It didn't work out well for him. Please get these ideas out, the eastern and the western ways. Get it out of your heads. Running after money, running after reputation, running after friendship with the children of this world. All those things, put it away. It doesn't work. God says, oh Jacob, come to me. I will show you how to walk in my light. Amen. We pray. Father, we come to you, Lord, in the name of Jesus this evening. Many are our desires. And often in our prayer meetings, in our personal prayers, in everything, we are telling you what we desire. Very rarely do we ask you, Lord, what you desire of me. Father, we have learned today that empty vessels only can be filled. Full vessels can never be filled. Only earthen vessels can be broken so that your light might shine. Oh, Father, help us to be simple, empty earthen vessels filled by you. When people around see us, read us, look at us, they will have to say, this is of God. There is nothing in this man or woman child. What is happening is of God. Help us, O God, in every area of our life as we grow in you. To be just reflectors of your glory. Because we have no glory in ourselves. Of ourselves. Help us, O God, not to steal your glory. As you said, I share my glory with none. Going to the rest of the week, help us to walk in the light of what we have heard. With this, simply with this desire to be filled of you, to be used of you for your glory. It may not even happen the way we think. It may not even happen the way even we desire. We may not be even recognized at all by our home, our family, our church, our generation. Maybe the only one who will see is you and you alone. Just to long. Help us to long just to be acknowledged by you and you alone. That one word, that one line. Well done, my good and faithful son. Enter into my joy. With all our churches, all our brethren, into thy hands. Be with them. Touch them. Run. We thank you, Father. We are all in partnership with one another. One body. 
one Lord, one head. May only your head be seen and the body be invisible of God. For in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.